Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to uh, August 7th, uh, the Muslim Space Khutbah. Uh, this is going to be basically a do over from a couple weeks ago. We had some technical difficulties. Bismillah, inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdih allahu fala mudilla lah, wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu an na muhammadin abduhu wa rasooluh. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, attaqu allahu haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa entum muslimun. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما. All praises belong to Allah. We praise Him and ask Him for forgiveness and guidance. But we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evils of our own actions. And whoever Allah guides, no one can lead him or her astray. And whoever He leads astray, no one can make take him or her back to the straight path. I bear witness that there is no other God or deity except Allah by himself, no associates with him, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. O you who have believed, be mindful of Allah as he should be, as he sh and be mindful of him at all times, and do not die except as a Muslim. O you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and always say a word directed towards the truth so that he can make your conduct whole and sound and forgive you for your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has attained the highest achievement. Uh, brothers and sisters um, on the Zoom call, uh, we're going to go over Surah Al-Layl, which is this 92nd Surah of the Qur'an. It's an important Surah, and as I was going through the tafsir and thinking about it, it really is something to reflect on and makes you think about what real is real in this world. It's foundational and sets uh, the basic theme for our tradition. This is a tradition or a religion or a deen of action, belief, and attesting to the ultimate goodness and beauty of Allah. So with every surah, it's important to know where it came from or when it was revealed. Scholars are divided on this one. Was it revealed in Mecca or was it in Medina? Some say it was in Mecca. Uh, and for those who think it was in Mecca, it has to do with uh, Abu Bakr's practice of purchasing the freedom of Bilal. And this surah was revealed about that episode. And this was discussed in a previous khutbah. For those scholars who think it was revealed in Medina, they say it was revealed after an episode when a wealthy landowner about a wealthy landowner and some kids, some poor kids next door. So this guy had some date palms, uh, and one of them had these long branches that would um, lean over his property into the next property. And whenever the dates fell down, those neighboring kids would just eat the dates on the ground. Well, so this guy finds out, and he gets really upset, and he demands to be paid back. But the kid's dad's like, I don't have anything to pay. I have no way to pay you back. So they get into a big conflict. The landowner threatens to cut the branches so that the kids can't get any more. And this conflict gets all the way up to the prophet. So then he asks the landowner to donate the date palm, and the guy is like, no way. So uh, upon hearing this answer, one of the prophet's companions, uh, who's pretty wealthy, hears about this and offers to buy the date palm. The guy refuses. And they go back and forth until the companion offers something, I forget the number, something like 40 date palms in, in uh, to trade for this one day palm, which is insane, uh, but that's what happened. So he did that. So some will say this surah was really revealed in that. So let's get into the surah. Bismillah <laughs> so the first verse, Allah says, by the night as it enshrouds and by the day that it discloses. Allah swearing by the night and day. In the Quran, Allah swears by certain things, and that's meant to bring our attention to those things is important. And here our attention is to be directed to a duality. 
So the word yaksha means to extend and cover, as in a spreading of the darkness. And the contrast here is between the darkness and enlightenment. Perhaps it's an analogy between ignorance and knowledge. Both conditions, darkness and light, are necessary for the other to exist. One cannot have darkness without light, and one can't have light without darkness. It's by definition they need each other. So think about that. And we need to also acknowledge and think about that there's a purpose for both physical darkness and light. Allah could have made it just dark the whole time or light the whole time. There's a purpose for both and there's a need for both. And then the second verse Allah says, by him who created the male and the female. This is, this is another duality. And here Allah is swearing also by himself and that's significant. And here is Allah is emphasizing his creation is something tremendous. And God is specifically mentioning male and female. And this, in, in and of itself, stresses the importance of both genders. And I asked myself when I was reading this, why even have genders? You know, the creation of the human being in and of itself is a testament to Allah's power. But then why genders? Why not just have just men or just women? You know, perhaps both are necessary for balance in society in the same way that we need night and day. Perhaps one is to complement, not complement, complement the other, as in two halves making a whole. That's my personal speculation. So if that's the case, then what does it mean when we suppress female agency? Well, when we place our sisters, our mothers, and our daughters in the proverbial back of the bus. So what does that say about us? Moving on, the third verse, third ayah, Allah says, truly your endeavors are diverse. What Allah is highlighting here is the diversity of the world. And again, why is there diversity in what we do? Essentially, you know, Allah could have made us all doing the exact same thing or have the same function. You know, it's like the law of diversity is part of Allah's will and plan. The existence of this diversity is an attribute of this world, just as day and night are, just as male and female are a part of the world. And then one has to think about next, what do we do when we're faced with this diversity? For some of us, it's negative emotions or negative reactions, fear, hate, envy, contempt, Perhaps it's a positive thing, admiration. You know, when it's a negative thing, it can be a threat to our identity. And the reality is this diversity in endeavors and behaviors, it's all part of Allah's divine plan. It's the way it is. It's nothing, it has nothing to do with me or you. It's just, that's the way it is. So think about that the next time we encounter someone or you encounter someone with a different job, someone with a different thought, different ideas or behaviors from, our, from your own. It doesn't mean that they're better or they're worse. It's just that's it. They're just different. At the same time, you have to remember, uh, this doesn't mean that all these endeavors or all these diversities are equally good. We'll see that in the, in the next three verses. Allah continues in this, ver in this in the surah, as for one who gives and is reverent and attests to what is beautiful. Notice here we have two words, giving and reverence. And the first thing to observe here is that giving is before reverence. Action is before belief. Action and belief are together in this ayah, but the action comes first. As in Allah is stressing to us to give or to do good, and then be mindful of Allah. Our tradition, Islam, is a tradition of action. Simply sitting around and praying without any action is not sufficient in and of itself. As for being reverent and having taqwa, Scholars will define it as being mindful of Allah in such a way that it informs and influences our behavior. That is real reverence, not just being mindful of Allah, but saying, if I do this, will it make Allah happy? Is it the right thing to do? That is taqwa. So not just being mindful of Allah, but also acting and doing things, keeping Allah at the forefront of our thoughts to inform how we do and what we do. As for what is beautiful, some scholars will say that is attesting to Allah and attesting to Allah's creation. I say the saying of mine, and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver of the merciful. Bismillah, walhamdulillah. In the name of Allah, all exaltations to Allah, peace and blessings to Allah and the Messenger. So, so far we have the dualities of night and day, 
male and female, the diversity of our endeavors, and then giving and being mindful of Allah in such a way that it informs our actions, and then believing and attesting to what is beautiful, action and belief. All of these are dualities. So then we get into the next part, and we shall ease his way unto ease. What we see here is the culmination of the characteristics described in prior verses, giving, having taqwa, attesting to what is beautiful. If we do these things daily, in whatever actions or endeavors we have, then Allah will take care of the rest. Meaning, do your best to serve others in the best way possible, in a way that you know will please Allah, which is basically attesting to what is beautiful, and then Allah will make your path easy. If we give, and we are reverent by doing this, we're attesting to goodness and beauty, and Allah will come to our aid. And as for one who is miserly and deems himself self-sufficient, that's the next verse, unquote. Another duality, miserly and self-sufficient. We come to the contrast of what came before. Previously, giving and taqwa go hand in hand. And now we see two other characteristics, two other characteristics go hand in hand. Miserliness and self-sufficiency. And again, we see action first, holding back, and then the belief. Here the belief is, I believe I'm independent and I have no one to depend on. I don't need to depend on anyone. It's almost as if our actions inform the belief. If I hold back, I'm, I'm self-sufficient. And we're being warned in this verse. The less we give and do for others, the more miserly we become and act. It, is almost, it almost follows that we start to lose the sense that we're not in control. That the reality is, we lose the sense that we are really not the ones in control when the reality is we are utterly and entirely dependent upon Allah. Once I forget, once I start to lose that, that we are dependent on Allah, then I start to believe that I'm self-sufficient. I don't need anyone or anything. So stop and think about that. Your actions influence, your actions influence your beliefs. Further, holding back is a sign of a lack of faith in God. As uh, Professor Khaled Abu Fadl in California says, it's as if one doesn't trust the one who gave him in the first place to give him again. It's as if one doesn't trust the one who, is give, who gave him in the first place to give him again. That's the definition of being miserly or holding back. Coveting is incompatible with belief. In the next verse, Allah says, and denies what is be beautiful. Again, as in being miserly or feeling self-sufficient leads to a denial of what is beautiful. Allah then says, we shall ease his way into hardship. When one turns away from Allah, God will make it easy for things to become complicated for that person. And then the next verse, Allah will, and his wealth shall not avail him when he perishes, unquote. The last word of that verse also sometimes translates into deteriorates, and his wealth shall not avail him when he deteriorates. The meaning here is pretty self-evident, that miserliness and coveting things won't do us any good at the end. Allah says next, truly ours is to give guidance. Some scholars say that in this verse, Allah is guaranteeing us guidance if we give, if we are reverent, and attest to what is beautiful, as it stated before. Allah then ends the ends the surah with a few verses, truly unto us belongs the hereafter in this world. Thus I have warned you of a raging fire, which none shall enter save the most wretched, who denies and turns away, and the most reverent shall be removed from it, who gives his wealth to purify, not recompensing any for a favor, thereby, save for seeking the face of his Lord, the Most High. So, I got lost for a second. Um, Allah says, um, truly unto us belong the hereafter in this world. All of the wealth and bounty and the beauty of this world is not mine, it's not yours, it is all Allah's. It always has been, and it always will be. So how can we be miserly, or how can we hold back when it doesn't really belong to me, hold belong to us in the first place? Allah says also that by doing that, that the, the threat is of a raging fire, and the only ones who will go in there are the most wretched, whoever turns away. So some commentators say that the, that of the Quran say that this entire surah is about that guy who had that piece of land in that tree who denied giving it to that family. So that's a powerful thing. That simple thing, just giving that one tree away, uh, he's threatened with the raging fire forever. And the ones who are reverent, the ones who have taqwa, like we talked before, we define taqwa, being mindful of Allah such an, 
in such a way that it informs your actions, will be removed from the fire. That's it. It's very simple. Being mindful of Allah. I'm going to do this. I know it's going to make Allah happy. I'm going to give what really isn't mine. I'm just giving what I happen to be holding. It's that, e it's that easy, quote unquote, easy. And the reason you do it is not because you want to be seen, not because you want a favor from someone else. I'm going to give you this because you're going to give me that back. It's because it just makes Allah happy. Save for seeking the face of his Lord, the Most High, and surely he'll be content. That Allah's giving us the key to being content. So uh, some commentators of the Quran will say that these last verses refer to that companion who bought that tree for the poor family. And again, for those scholars who believe that this surah came down in Mecca in relation to Abu Bakr, that these verses apply to him. The point being that giving charity and puring, purifying oneself and one's, is purifying yourself and your wealth. In the end, if we are given, then we have to give for many reasons. One, because the act of giving informs our belief. When I give, then I trust Allah to give me again. When I give, I'm attesting to what is beautiful. When I give, I attest that everything is Allah's and not really mine to give. And give doesn't mean money. It means your time, your smile, the gesture on your face. When I give, I'm attesting that everything belongs to Allah and not mine. It's not mine to give. It's Allah's. And when I hold back, I don't trust Allah to give me again. When I hold back, I believe it's really mine. When I hold back, I am denying what is beautiful. So keep that in mind. That's why this surah is important. Surah to Layl, surah number 92. Read it again and think about these verses. And read the tafsir if you have access to one. And in the end, I conclude, and I ask Allah at the end, to help us remember that we are all equal in His sight. Male, female, black, white, wealthy, not so wealthy, beautiful, maybe not so beautiful, whatever it is. I ask Allah to help us to be reverent so we can elevate ourselves in His eye. We ask you, Allah, to become of those who give and love to give to make you happy, to increase our faith we ask you, Allah, to increase our faith in you so we are ever mindful of you and that that mindfulness informs our actions and how we behave. And we ask you, Allah, to be of those who believe and attest to what is beautiful and to make our paths easy. We ask you, Allah, to help us to avoid being stingy and covetous and holding back and avoid feelings of fear that drive those behaviors and to help us avoid feeling self-sufficient or feeling like we are in control because Allah, you are the one in control. We ask you Allah to help our brothers and sisters who are ill with COVID-19 throughout the world. We ask you Allah to help our brothers and sisters in China who are in concentration camps. We ask you Allah to help our brothers and sisters suffering from climate change. We ask you Allah to help our brothers and sisters in this country and around the world who have been affected financially with, uh, with the pandemic and the shutdown. We ask Allah to help our brothers and sisters in Beirut who, to recover physically and mentally from that devastating explosion that just happened this week. Ibad Allah, inna Allah ya'muru bil adi wal ihsan wa ita'i dal qulba wa yanha anu fahshai wal munkari wal bab ya'adakum la'alakum tadakkaru ibkuru Allah. O servants of Allah, Allah commands justice in the doing of good and liberality to kith and kin and he forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion and Allah instructs, us, instructs you that you can remember. Remember, Allah is the supreme, and Allah is the supreme in glory, and Allah will remember you. And be thankful to him, and he will increase you in your bounty, and seek forgiveness in Allah, and he will forgive you. And have taqwa, and be mindful of Allah at all times, so he can make a way out for you, and he will make a way out for you, and make your path easy. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. So thank you for listening. Um, that concludes the khutbah portion. So announcements for Muslim space for this week. So uh, tonight, uh, 6.30, 8 o'clock Central Time, Islam in Black America, continuing the conversation um, uh, on basically Islam in Black America, Sherman, Dr. Sherman Jackson's course uh, at Bayan. Uh, tonight, the discussion is on modules 15A, 16A, 16B, and 16C. So 15A and 16, uh, if you haven't watched them, uh, watch them before tonight's uh, um, Zoom class. Go onto the website, you can log in. Uh, even if you haven't watched them, still log in. The conversations are, are uh, eye-opening. Then uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, the summer story time. Again, virtual reading of kids' books. 
uh, from 11 o'clock to probably 11.30 or so. Uh, Nadia Ghani Alam will be reading uh, some stories tomorrow. Again, go on the website, register to get the link. Uh, Saturday, August 15th, from 4 to 5 o'clock. So that's next Saturday, from 4 to 5 p.m., the Wisdom Tea on Zoom. So this will be the Senior Social Hour. It'll become a bi-weekly virtual gathering for the senior community. That means 60 plus, none of you 50 year olds. I'm not allowed, I'm just kidding. Uh, it'll be a fun social gathering where we'll get a chance to chat, learn support, and just connect. You know, a lot of us are pretty much stuck at home. Um, it's nice just to see faces. And then a new thing, uh, that evening, Saturday, August 15th at 8.30 p.m., a virtual game night. So virtual game night will be at 8.30 p.m. Central Time, and then it'll be every month. It'll be on Zoom, joined from the comfort of your own home. We're going to play a variety of team and individual games designed to be easily facilitated online. Uh, it'll be open to age 16 and older. So this August 15th, which is the week from tomorrow, it'll be Pictionary online. Uh, the next month in September, it'll be Team Trivial Pursuit. The month in October, it'll be Scategories. In November, Charades. And the 19th December, it'll be Outburst. So if you have an iPad or a tablet device, that'll be best, or a computer is best, um, better than using a mobile phone. So either an iPad or a tablet or a laptop or a computer. Uh, and then it'll be easier if you sign in with your own device so that you can play this game. It'll be pretty, it shouldn't be too hard. It might be, if, uh, uh, won't be too hard to do it. And there'll be some explanation how to get, uh, to get on. Please get on the, the website to register for that. I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. And that's pretty much it. Um, Okay, okay to hang out and just say hi to everyone. And assalamu alaikum. Um, we'll see you next week, inshallah.